I'm Army Sergeant Jesse Anderla, and this is the Desert Vision. Coming up, U.S. Army riggers and airmen work hard to help those in need, and Task Force Top Guns help make Afghanistan a better place. The U.S. military has a long history of helping those in need, going back to the time of its founding. A group of soldiers and airmen show what it takes to package and deliver humanitarian aid when lives are at stake. The sounds of pallets and forklifts are commonplace here. There you are. Good. It's the home of the Army Riggers, a group of dedicated soldiers who build cargo bundles for operations across the theater. Today, they're braving the heat and humidity to support ongoing humanitarian aid airdrop missions over Iraq. Today, we're rigging high velocity parachutes onto loads of water, and uh, we're also doing 32 loads of MREs, high velocity. More than 20 riggers and a few airmen, airmen like Captain Joe Nash, are stepping out of their comfort zone to help the cause. This pretty much allows us to kind of feel like we're actually, uh, you know, seeing the difference in what we're doing out there. It's a full circle operation where some major construction skills and teamwork stop, race just a little, lead to pallets ready to roll out to the folks who need them most. Tech Sergeant Trevor Pedro, Southwest Asia. Task Force Top Guns are in charge of force protection for the Bagram Security Zone, but there's more to the job. Staff Sergeant Daniel Sullivan went with the Top Guns to Gollum Ali to find out what separates their special mission from their everyday routine. The citizens of Gollum Ali are celebrating the groundbreaking for the reconstruction of their village's school. Task Force Top Guns of the 101st Airborne Division are creating projects like this all over the Bagram Security Zone. The man running 12 of these projects, First Lieutenant Philip Young, is using SERP to make a difference. It helps a lot for the kids. SERP is the Commander's Emergency Relief Program. It's a program we use to do things for villages that have no direct or indirect benefits for us that are strictly for the villagers. We use that to get people jobs. Jobs is our primary purpose to get people to work, to do things for themselves and their, for their community. These jobs will go directly to the villagers of Gollum Ali, who will repair the 2,000 student school. Without this project, leaks in the roof would have slowly destroyed the building. They're getting by right now with the current roof, but with the leaks that it has, it's going to start to damage the structural integrity. And if we don't go in now and do something, then the roof's going to probably collapse. The school wasn't the only structure in trouble. And uh, this is the x-ray room. Several weeks ago, Task Force Top Gun surveyed the Gollum Ali Clinic, the primary care facility in the Bagram District. They found its x-ray room in massive disrepair. This is the x-ray machine in here. Okay. But weeks later, the room has made a drastic turn for the better. So they put the brick down, plaster it, put a layer of lead shielding, and then they come over with another set of plaster. Projects like this bring the community together through shared effort and civic pride, and perhaps more importantly, help secure the future of Afghanistan's children. Reporting from Gullam Ali, I'm Army Staff Sergeant Daniel Sullivan. Soldiers with the 1st Battalion 16th Infantry Regiment participated in a first responder trauma lane. The participants had to complete an eight mile ruck march and care for several casualties under fire. Army Staff Sergeant Noel Gehrig explains. Soldiers assigned to the 1st Battalion 16th Infantry Regiment Iron Rangers participated in a first responders trauma lane at Camp Ewing, Kuwait. The training was designed to enhance proficiency in basic life-saving methods and increase medical proficiency among combat medics. Sergeant Saul Martinez, combat medic with 116th Infantry, explains. We had uh, 18 candidates from uh, Iron Ranger Battalion. They competed in a seven mile road march. And then we had them do trauma lanes afterwards that consisted of basically going through uh, basic CLS and TC3 events. Tactical Combat Casualty Care is the guidelines, the protocol that we use as medics. It goes through three different phases of care, and we follow those phases of care throughout combat. The first phase is care under fire, tactical field care is the second phase, and then tactical evac is the third phase. So we use that as our guideline as to how to treat casualties. 
Staying proficient on these skills is vital to every life on the battlefield. Major Tracy Dominguez, Brigade Surgeon with the 1st Armor Brigade Combat Team, tells us why training like this is important. Well, these skills are perishable. Putting on a tourniquet, controlling the bleeding. Uh, if you need a refresh on those skills more than every three months, if you don't continually practice, you won't be ready for the battlefield or combat situation. And especially today's situation where it was done under stress, this is probably the optimum time to train them at when the situation does arise where they need to utilize their skills, they're familiar with it. When it comes to casualties on the battlefield, each passing moment is critical. The skills the Iron Rangers enhance through this training ensures they will have the proficiency required to make every second count. Reporting for the 1st Armored Brigade Combat Team in Camp Earring, Kuwait, I'm Army Staff Sergeant Noel Gehrig. Through U.S. Arsense Energy Awareness Campaign, the Army is looking into new ways of improving energy and fuel conservation. But don't take my word for it, just ask a Joe. These shades will reduce solar exposure by 85%, which will decrease temperatures inside the structure by at least 15 degrees. By utilizing this technology and keeping an eye on fuel consumption, we can all help reduce fuel use and increase energy efficiency. This message is for you, our leaders, officer, NCO, and civilian. You can make a difference. The Army remains committed to taking aggressive and appropriate actions to educate and equip soldiers and leaders with the right complement of programs and resources to serve the health promotion, risk reduction, and suicide prevention needs of the Army family. Anyone and everyone can make a difference, but change starts with leadership and knowing your resources. Make this Suicide Awareness Guide for Leaders a part of your toolkit. Implement, promote, and use it. Remember, shoulder to shoulder, we can all remain Army strong. Without the sacrifice, hard work, and selfless service from many of the 4,000 plus men and women from over 16 countries who are here supporting us from around the world, our success would not be possible. These invaluable members of our team leave their families for years at a time to help provide essential services in pursuit of providing their loved ones with greater opportunity and a higher quality of life. Our Army values require and demand we show respect and dignity to all, whether in uniform or out. This requirement extends to the thousands of civilians within our area of responsibility that make it all possible for service members on a daily basis. Even one incident of disrespect seriously hinders our mission and our relationships that we have all worked for many years to build. Whether you are at the gym, the DFAC, or any of the hundreds of locations in which we interact with our host nation civilian workers, be courteous, polite, and respectful show sincere appreciation for their service to our nation. U.S. Army Central, Patton Zone. It takes a combined effort to maintain a fit fighting force, and every so often the unsung heroes are overlooked. Here is a taste of one dining facility that sheds some light on a vital part of military operations many soldiers visit daily, yet know little about. Many hands make light work, and for the Camp Air of John Zone 2 dining facility, they also make healthy food. I make sure everybody following the recipe card, then the product is the right product they are preparing. So those things are is very important, and also the cook's uh, prospective, they do check, then they also consult with the uh, army cooks to so make sure the product is right. Along with healthy choices, the DFAC also provides specialty menus like Surf and Turf Fridays that are a big hit with soldiers. You know, we look forward to it. You can smell it as you're walking up. They're cooking on the grill out back. And it's kind of, you know, time to sit down with everybody and eat a barbecued meal. So it's pretty good. The Zone 2 DFAC serves approximately 5,000 troops a day which means the staff must be committed day in and day out to provide the best service. I gotta go past with the parts more. They gotta, you know, I gotta keep in a line and, you know, they gotta happy also. I gotta keep line and uh, other customer coming. So the next time you find yourself in line for your next meal, remember, your food wasn't just prepared, it was crafted with care. 
Reporting for U.S. Army Central, I'm Army Sergeant Woodbridge Dean Bullock. The U.S. military is saving money and reducing its footprint with recycling programs. Army Sergeant Rodney Roldan shows us the greener side of Bagram Airfield. Coalition forces are looking at things from a greener perspective. The waste management complex on Bagram Airfield is moving towards programs such as recycling that help reduce pollution and lead to reduced landfill emissions. The waste management complex, the contract was awarded in August of 2012 for the Corps of Engineers. Ultimately, it's going to be an enduring waste management complex for Bagram Airfield. Bagram's recycle rate average for 2014 is 37%, which is higher than the average rate back in the States. In accordance with US-4 Alpha Environmental Standard Operating Procedures, 35% of the accumulated waste is recycled, 50% is further sorted by local nationals or landfilled, and 15% is incinerated. Dual chambered incinerators are much larger than the ones we have, much more efficient. They follow all the standards that uh, US-4 Alpha put forth in their uh, standard operating procedure back in June of 12. While use of an incinerator is the least desired method of waste reduction, the newly constructed incinerators on this site have a 98% waste reduction efficiency. The incinerator turns enough trash to fill a single-story house into enough ash to fill a barrel. The recycling program is one that benefits both personnel assigned to Bagram Airfield and the local population of the Parwan province. It's not built for just a year or two years. It is a facility that will last forever, uh, for next 20 years at least. Reporting from Bagram Airfield, Afghanistan, I'm Sergeant Rodney Roldan. What would you give up to protect your brothers and sisters in arms? Maybe your time, your friends, or possibly your career. These are some of the tough questions being asked to soldiers after they experience part of a Broadway play that addresses a very real and sensitive subject. I know the project is working when the lowest ranking member of the audience speaks the truth of his or her experience in front of the highest ranking when we've created a permissive enough environment where the hierarchy goes away for a little bit. It's creating a leaderless environment for a few minutes and saying, hey, we're all human beings and we all have a responsibility to one another. We perform uh, scenes from a play that was performed off-Broadway uh, in the 90s called Tape, and it's not a play written with this express intent in mind. It's not, a, it's not about uh, education at its core. It's entertaining, it's provocative, it's slightly profane. In essence, it conveys to the audience, we're not here to preach, we're here to provoke a discussion. If an audience can identify with the characters, then um, the issues seep in through in a different way. And uh, we start to think about these things in a different way. And we hopefully, if we're a male soldier, we will, we will understand the female's perspective in a way that we wouldn't in our everyday life, and vice versa. Um, I was really confused through the whole time. Did he actually rape her? The hope is that when people come to it from their own personal sense of what's right and wrong, when they tell their stories, that the lessons that may come out of this discussion go deeper than if we put a PowerPoint up on stage and try to drill those messages into the audience. I'm a survivor. Programs like this is necessary because um, you never know if the soldier to your left or your right has been sexual assaulted before or sexual harassed before. So the CHARP program gives people courage. They also provide confidence. Their situation is going to get taken care of. Yeah, I like it a lot. Yeah? Definitely, it's good. It's a, it's a pretty good job. One of the challenges for people who've experienced sexual assault is finding the road to reclaiming their story, reclaiming the power that may have felt they lost along the way. I think storytelling, I think in a communal sense with supportive peers on either side, feeling validated by your community, those are steps to healing. I want there to be a communication gap here. Modern Army combative techniques can be difficult for any soldier to learn. Imagine being from a different country or even speaking a different language. Army Sergeant Jeremy Odom explains how defending yourself can be translated no matter where you're from or what language you speak. Normally the term combat is not mentioned in a peacekeeping mission, but that was not the case in the Sinai recently. 
U.S. soldiers offered a modern army combatives force to the other nations who also serve in the desert as part of the multinational force and observers. Service members from five nations volunteered to get roughed up a bit so that they can learn to fight for their life should that time ever come. The course extended over two weeks and was taught by U.S. Army certified instructors. Though participants tested each other during the sparring segments, it also strengthened their camaraderie. I thought it was really good to get out with the different nations. Uh, we had uh, Americans, Hungarians, and Canadians, and uh, it, uh, we all worked as a team and we all got through it and uh, it was a good experience. For the American trainers, there were a few communication issues between the foreign languages and the variety of martial art disciplines the nations brought. It made instruction challenging, but by the end of the course, the barriers were overcome. When they finally grasp the move and you get that sense of satisfaction from them that, yes, I finally got it, it's uh, very satisfying for me knowing that I can teach all of the nations our training and have them successfully understand it. Students had different reasons for participating in the class. For some, it was for promotion points and others to increase self-development. But for one platoon leader, he endured the week of pain with the hopes of wanting to train his soldiers for combat. I'm a volunteer in this class because I want to improve my combat skills and this new class with new techniques that I want to learn so I can use it with my soldiers back home in Colombia. Sergeant Romero also said, although the practical portions were demanding, he liked the class and thought the results were worth it. From Sinai, Egypt, I'm Sergeant Jeremy Odom. That wraps up this edition of the Desert Vision. Find these stories and more at facebook.com slash US Army Central. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.